evening and good morning and good afternoon and wherever you're joining us from welcome to tcu and welcome to another edition of our facebook live session my name is heath einstein and i have the great pleasure of serving tcu as dean of admission and joining me tonight is a dear colleague imani wimberly from the um, office of housing and residence life and we have a fantastic hour uh, ahead, I hope, I think. Um, every time we do one of these programs or every time we have a program on campus, we always like to start with a land acknowledgement and appreciation of the space that we are in. Um, TCU uh, respectfully acknowledges all native peoples who have lived on this land since time immemorial. And we pay particular respect to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose ancestral homeland we sit. Um, I always love, at the beginning of these Facebook Live sessions, seeing where everybody is joining us from. Imani, I don't know if you were scrolling through as people were writing in, but this is so cool. We have Amy from here in North Texas. She's from Frisco. We have Austin down in Houston. We have, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Aratusa from Athens, Greece. That is awesome that we have people joining us from around the world. Chris is from Colorado Springs. We've got folks from... Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia. I saw someone from um, Rockland, California, which is in the Sacramento area. So that's just awesome. Okay, we're gonna be together for um, the next roughly hour. And this is a Q&A session mostly. We're gonna talk for a few minutes um, on tonight's topic, which is housing. But, um, but please, primarily, we wanna get your questions answered. So you can even start asking questions now and we'll queue them up and get to as many as possible. We've been doing these Facebook Live sessions now um, for, oh gosh, well over a year now. Um, and we've talked about everything from visiting campus to what to do over a summer break. We've talked about the Honors College. We've talked about how the major you choose is affect and it could affect the admission decision. Um, we try to hit as much about the admission process in general, as well as admissions at TCU as we can and talk about what life on this campus is like. And that's where tonight comes in because we're talking about the housing process. Now we know that among the audience, we have students and parents and guardians. Um, and some of the students are admitted students who have decided to enroll at TCU. Awesome, go frogs. We just passed the May 1 uh, deposit deadline. So, and, and we have closed our class and we're in a very fortunate position to have been able to do that. At many colleges, they have not yet got their first year class in and they don't necessarily want to wait, let their wait list go. Um, we fortunately are in a position where we can say we're done with um, this class. We now hand this group of students on to our talented colleagues across campus and we're on to the next class, which brings me to the next group of people who are with us tonight. And that is the students who may be just now embarking on the college search. So you might be a high school junior or sophomore or a first year student in high school or earlier. Um, you might be a transfer student. You might be interested in knowing about what housing is available, uh, if any, for transfer students. So we're hoping to get to all of your questions no matter where you are in this process. Um, depending on how the questions go, if you've got questions on other topics and we've run out of things to talk about on housing, we can talk about that as well. I do wanna mention that next month, um, we're going to be doing our Facebook Live session on job placement and, and career center and all that stuff. Um, it is not going to be on the first Wednesday of the month. However, it's actually going to be on the second Wednesday, which is June 8th. So circle your calendars now, June 8th, 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Um, and uh, and and that's about, that's about it. Um, I, I just want to say one thing before I turn it over to Imani um, for a little bit on the housing process. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not, really a huge fan of rankings, uh, except for when they make us look good. And the Princeton Review has ranked our housing um, consistently over the years um, as among the best in the country. I think the most recent ranking I saw was number four, but that could, yeah, see, there you go. Fourth best in the country, according to the Princeton Review. So there is a lot to love about housing at uh, Texas Christian University. So Imani, uh, why don't you take it away and, uh, and then we'll get to the questions. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as was already said, my name is Imani Wimberly. I serve as one of the assistant directors of housing and residence life here at TCU. Um, I have been working in housing and residence life at TCU since 2015. 
I uh, started as a hall director. Now I'm working in the central office. And so I am extremely excited to be able to answer some questions for you all today. I see that they are already coming in fast and furious. Um, so I'll, I'll try and keep it brief so that we can get to the most questions. But to kick us off with the first answer to a question, move-in dates are actually announced for our incoming first year students. Um, so you can see them on the screen, um, as well as you can find them on our website. So if you don't screenshot it now or remember, um, you can always visit us on our website and we have a uh, drop down button for move in so you can find those dates. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about move in as we progress through our time together. Fantastic. OK, so let's start with these questions. And um, I'm going to start uh, with a question that Tiffany Ingram Walker has asked, and that is, my daughter does not have a roommate yet. If she completes the info on the housing portal this week, but finds a roommate before the deadline, can she go back in and add that person as a roommate? So that that's a fantastic question, um, and uh, and one I'm sure a lot of folks are are wondering. Um, so Imani, I wonder if maybe you answer that question, and then and then also just talk about in general how the housing application process works. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so to answer the question first, yes. Um, so the application will close on December 10th, or sorry, not December, <laughs> June 10th. <laughs> uh, June 10th is when the application will close. So at any point between now and June 10th, you can go back in and edit it. So let's say that your student goes to fraud camp or orientation or just meets someone um, through some of the organic channels of social media. Uh, and they've already completed their application, they can go back in and put themselves in a group uh, for roommates together if they like. Um, there will be a short period of time that let's say you meet somebody on the 10th at 9 a.m. and we close it on the 10th at 8 a.m. There'll be a short period of time in which we might still be able to help you out, um, but we're gonna hope that the vast majority of those people will get them in before that deadline passes. Talk a little bit about what the actual application looks like is we are going to ask a number of questions. Um, we call it a survey um, and it's really for us to get a better understanding of what is your lived lifestyle um, so that when people are looking for roommate groups and selecting their rooms then they can have a better base of knowing what might this person be like to live with. And so what I mean by that is we ask questions like what time do you try and go to sleep? Um, do you like to keep your space tidy or can you be a little bit messy? Um, do you smoke? Do you drink? Things of that sort. And those are questions that we have found in housing and residence life can often be um, really big things that cause conflict amongst roommates. And so to be able to try and start people off where they can find someone that might have the same lifestyle or the same answers uh, can also help us in terms of cutting down on the conflict that happens and so that our staff uh, doesn't have to mediate that as you all are with us. Um, Imani, I know a question that comes up a lot is um, about students who are locating roommates ahead of time on their own through those organic channels that you mentioned, or maybe they just know somebody coming to TCU versus the students who um, complete the questionnaire and allow TCU to select the roommate. Can you talk about that? Some of the, um, uh, some of the outcomes that you see? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll start off with statistically, we don't see that there's any major differences, whether you knew your roommate before or, or if you met them um, as a part of the potluck uh, or general or room selection um, process. And so that is super fortunate, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean that if I don't know somebody already and I don't pick myself into a roommate group, I'm going to have a very different experience than maybe someone who came with their friend from high school. Um, I will say that uh, we will, for the most, uh, for most of our students, they will actually select their roommates themselves uh, because our selection process, which will take place on June 25th, it allows our students to go into the system and select their room. And so think if you've ever bought maybe a concert ticket um, and you pick a seat or a seat on an airline, uh, then you're able to go in and specifically select the residence hall and that room that you want to be in. And if someone is already in that space and I do not currently have a roommate, as I hover over that space, it'll tell me that someone's in the room. It'll also give me an idea of a percentage match of that survey that I talked about just a minute ago. Um, so my answers are 76% 
uh, match with the answers that they gave on their survey. Um, and you can also go into their profile to see what are the exact questions that they selected. Um, so maybe you're like, I don't actually care if they're a little messy because um, I'm tidy enough that we will be able to make that work. However, I very much don't want to be with someone who goes to sleep super early because I know that I'm a night owl. And so yeah. you'd be able to make that determination um, yourself. Fantastic. Uh, Maria asks a really interesting question. I'm sure it's on many people's minds. Does completing the info on the housing portal sooner rather than later get you an earlier spot in terms of when you get to choose your room? Yeah, great question. Um, and one we get all the time. Uh, so no, it actually doesn't. It is not a first come first serve. Um, so it'll open again. It is currently open May 1st and it'll close on June 10th. And so we will let everyone apply during that period of time. And then after June 10th, then we will close it. And then a computer will auto generate time slots or random numbers to everyone. And so it doesn't matter if you're the first person or literally the very last person to put in your application, uh, you'll randomly be given a, a time slot for when you will be able to go back into the system to select your actual room. And housing selection will occur on June 25th. Mm -hmm. Um, I, th I think we might have mentioned that earlier. Um, and what happens if I know I want to live with someone and I've been assigned a time and the other person has been assigned a time? How does that exactly work? How, who, whose time do we go with and, and so forth? Yeah, so I'll talk about the two different ways that can play out. So one is, I know that I want to live with this person. It is before that deadline. So we put ourselves in a group together. A roommate group. And so in those cases, uh, everyone that is assigned to that roommate group will get the exact same time slot. So our system will read that this is a grouping of people. And so they need to be able to access the system at the same time. Um, because as you can imagine, if I get a 9 a.m. time slot and my roommate gets a 2 p.m. time slot, uh, the chances of my room being open for that entire duration probably aren't that high. Um, and so that will happen. Let's say that you do not have, know who you want to live with, so you're not currently in a, a group with anyone, uh, then you will, and then you find them a little bit later in the process. Everybody will get a different time slot. We'll just encourage that whenever, whatever time slot you have, you go and you select into that room. You communicate with your roommate, hey, this is what I selected into for the person that is earliest to see if the second person can get it. If not, then we have what we call our wait list or room change form. And so we will open that on July 1st, once everybody has been able to select rooms. Uh, and then you would be, you and that roommate would fill out the wait list saying, hey, we were actually separated, but we'd love to be together. And so we will work to get you all back together and we'll ask some of your room preferences and things of that sort. And so then our assignments team then will uh, assign you all into a space together. Okay, so just to clarify, because Steph asked, Steph McKenna asked, can you add students to the form? after completing the housing form, is this the kind of situation you're talking about right now where, hey, the questionnaire is complete, we're past June 10, I now have found a roommate, we've been assigned different slots, and is that when you would use that um, that waitlist form? Correct, yeah, so there would be a very small window um, between the application closing and us sending out time slots in which we can still add you to the group. Um, however, once time slots go out, then we're not gonna be able to add people. Uh, it, creates a lot of chaos on the back end. And so then we would just encourage people to use that wait list form so that we can get those roommates back together. Okay. Um, Paula, uh, Paula Wallman Gerhardt asks, is housing available for transfer students? We've had a couple of questions in here about transfer housing um, and are upperclassmen housed together? So can you, those are two different questions. Um, how do we do transfer housing and then once students reach those upper class years, how does that work? Yeah, so for transfers, we definitely try and house transfers. Um, it really depends on what is the availability of space. Um, so here at TCU, we have a two year live on requirement, meaning that we house all first and second year students um, that are not within a 30 mile radius and have deemed and have applied to be a commuter. Um, and so once we know how many spaces we have available, then we will try and fill those with transfers or upperclassmen, um, things of that sort. So yes, it is available. It is limited. Um, so we are unfortunately not at a place in which we have enough 
uh, rooms to be able to offer to all of the transfer students. But every single year we will have transfers that do live on campus with us um, and, live, and live in our experiences. Uh, as a, in terms of the upper class, I do kind of want to clarify because um, we tend to use upper class for sophomores and above. Um, and I know some people think of juniors and above. Um, so as I talk about upper class and know that I'm speaking sophomores and above. Um, so we will have upperclassmen that stay in on campus with us. Again, we have that two year live on requirement. So pretty much all sophomores um, with exception to a few will live on campus and they will be housed together. Um, and so we have about roughly five residence halls that are built for upperclassmen and we'll have upperclassmen living in them. Um, they have typically a more suite style living or apartment style living. Um, so they're, they will almost always have a uh, private bedroom um, and then might have a living room. In some cases, if they're in the apartments, then they would also have a full kitchen in their space. So I hope hey, that Monty, was your question. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's, that's really, really interesting. And it, and it kind of triggers a thought in my head, which is, you know, and we have 26 residence halls on campus. They're absolutely beautiful um, and each have unique characteristics. Um, but there are some common um, amenities that can be found in all of them. I'm wondering if you might take a moment then to talk about just residence hall life in general. Why, um, what makes TCU's residence hall experience distinctive? Yeah, that, that number four ranking, right? How do we get yeah. there? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, or we really credit that to our model, which is knowing, connecting, and empowering. Um, so in layperson's terms, what that means is we care for all of our residents and we build relationships with them. Um, so here at TCU, we are very strategic to have smaller residence hall halls so that we can really get to know them. Um, so where I went to college, then I worked in a hall that there was about a thousand students that lived there. And so as you can imagine, it is gonna be incredibly difficult for a staff and a hall director to try and get to know a thousand students over the course of one academic year. Um, so we will cap out, our largest hall is about 450 people, um, and that is in our apartment complex. Uh, and so some of those students are looking to have a little bit more uh, privacy, um, but we will tend to try and have smaller halls so that we can build those relationships. And when I talk about relationship building, it is really about like deeper level, not just surface level. So really understanding like, where are you from? Uh, what are some of your favorite things? We have RAs that will uh, find out their favorite snack or their residents' favorite snacks or drinks and just buy all of that for them if they're having a hard day or something came up. Um, understanding when their tests are and reaching out to them to wish them luck or check in to see how, how it went. Um, but really knowing and making sure that the people that live in our building know that they matter to us um, and that we want to be there to support them in the good as well as uh, sometimes the bad. Um, okay, we have a couple of really specific questions, okay. logis uh, logistically, and they're and they're and they're really good. Okay, so a couple of people have asked, with Frog Camp All Stars B being August 16 to 18, do they move in before? Do they move in on that August 13th date, or is it after? And and if uh, I don't know if you know all of the particulars, so I hate, yeah. I hate to put you on the spot, but how is that going to work for? for um, folks who've got these activities that are happening right around the same time as uh, as move-in? Yeah, so uh, I am not sure of the specifics of All-Star B. Um, what I will tell you is what we generally try to do. Um, so there are gonna be a number of reasons why students might have to come back a little bit earlier than class is starting. Um, and so what we do is we will work with our campus partners, um, albeit fraud camp or orientation, um, international students. Uh, students will come back for fraternity and sorority life uh, or even um, band. And so we work with them to say, when do you need your students back? And then we will try and get them into uh, the earliest move in that works with that. Um, sometimes there is overlap. Uh, so we've had some years in which uh, we'll give them an earlier time slot because they are starting whatever they're coming for uh, later that day so that they're able to really take advantage of both of those opportunities. Um, but we are working with uh, Frog Camp um, and our assignments team is working with them to figure out what is uh, the proper time to move in. And then also, if you get a move in time slot, uh, mm -hmm. then just communicate with us and we will always try and work with you if we can. And would the same thing be true of marching band? 
yep. members who have to come for a camp ahead of time. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, we asked people to submit questions uh, on Instagram ahead of time. We got a few of those. Uh, Jay Cohen asks, can you please explain the housing process for students in the Honors College? How does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Honors College housing is actually all through Honors. Um, so you will go through them. Um, I do believe that their assumption is that if you are an incoming first year student who is in Honors, then you will live in Milton Daniel. Um, they do have like an exception form. Uh, so you will be able to get that through them if you are asking not to live in Milton for whatever reason, and they will approve that or not. Um, essentially what happens is once they assign everybody into Milton, they just share that information with us. And so we input it into our system. Um, so anyone who that will be living in Milton will not go through the selection process on the 25th of June uh, because they would have already been placed by the Honors College. Okay, Imani, um, I, you haven't joined us for Facebook Live these sessions before. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you've been paying attention to it, but uh, over the last several months, we have uh, inserted at various points dad jokes. Okay, so Love I'm going to pause here for a dad joke. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna. i give you a moment to think about it if you want to give me an answer. If you don't know, that's okay too. Uh, so here's the question. What do you call a blind deer? A what do you call deer. a blind deer? I have no idea. You're really close. No idea. Oh. Very, yeah, you were really, you are, we're almost Dang. on it. Okay. Well, if I ever have children, I might get those a little bit quicker as yeah. I become a dad, you know? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let's get back to it. So we had a, a couple of questions that have to do with um, students who are um, are from the Fort Worth area mm -hmm. and and housing uh, for those students. So one is um, uh, Tamara asks, if you live locally, you don't need to live on campus, right? And you don't have to pay for any housing, right? Um, and then there's another question, which is similar. Um, Jocelyn uh, asks over Instagram, if you live close by TCU's campus, would you still recommend living in a dorm? So those are two similar questions. Mm -hmm. One is just technically, do you have to, um, or are you allowed to live at home? And then the other is, should you? Yeah, so uh, you are able to live at home. Um, so we have a commuter form. You can fill that out. You have to be within a 30 mile radius of TCU. Um, and there are some things that you'll need to do in order to get that approved. Um, so if you're not yet ready to come on campus, uh, then that is an option for you. Um, I would still recommend it. Obviously, I'm very biased. I work in housing and residence life. Um, however, we do find that um, students who live on campus tend to have a uh, different experience than those who don't. Um, depending on how far you do live away from campus, it means that sometimes you're driving later at night. Uh, sometimes it means you're making the decision of do I kind of randomly hang around campus so I can go to that program that happens later, even though I finished classes hours ago. Um, and so those are some decisions we see that our commuters have to make um, of, I wanna go to this program, I wanna be able to engage with the campus community. Um, so that means I'll drive home at a nine or 10 PM, um, or actually I'm gonna go home and maybe I'll tr come back, but if you're anything like me, once you hit that couch, getting back up is, is pretty difficult to do. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you mentioned earlier the two-year residency requirement and and 49% of all undergrads live on campus. So that's inclusive of the two year requirement and then um, minus the small number of uh, students in the first two years who will live at home and then includes some upper class students uh, mm -hmm. beyond their second year who, who live at home, I mean, who um, live on campus as well. Tell us what happens after that. Um, let's say I'm done with my second year at TCU and I'd like to remain on campus, what are the possibilities? And then if I, if that doesn't work out or I choose not to pursue that, what are the other housing options in the area? Yeah, so it is still a possibility. We do house juniors and seniors on campus. Um, I will say the high majority of them are because they have some type of scholarship that requires them to be on campus um, or a job, right? So um, our RAs are oftentimes upperclassmen, juniors and seniors. Um, and so they will live on campus. Uh, but we will always house some people. 
Um, it really depends on what does the spacing look like. Um, so we have had some super phenomenal uh, first year classes this year, uh, which means that we have not been able to offer as many spaces to our juniors and seniors as we are making sure to give beds to our first and second year students. Um, and so there will be that opportunity. However, there is significantly less than the two years that you have to live on. So we do see most of our students move off campus, um, albeit still within uh, the radius of TCU. There are a number of apartment complexes in which people will rent with that are all students, um, as well as a lot of uh, apartments and homes in which people will lease out uh, for rent to our students. Um, okay. A couple of very particular questions that came through on Instagram. We're really testing you here and your, your <laughs> knowledge of, of an on-campus living. One is, what is the ideal size fan to bring? If there is such a thing as an ideal size fan. Yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, secondly, can we bring an additional mini fridge? Uh, and so uh, I guess that begs the question, does every room have a mini fridge? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then... Can I bring a second one? Yeah, so they all will have a mini fridge. Um, we get them specialty made so that they don't break circuits. There is a micro fridge. Um, so there's a refrigerator, a small uh, freezer, and then there's a microwave attached to this one unit. So that'll be provided in every single room on campus. Um, in addition, uh, yes and no. Um, so there are certain times in which we will approve a additional mini fridge. We just ask people to reach out to us uh, using housing at tcu.edu um, in order to get that approval for whatever the reason is you might need it for. Um, and then in terms of the fan size, I, I have to go with whatever is best for you. Um, that's going to be my cop-out answer there. Um, we do have uh, the circular oscillating fans. As we see the tower fans are extremely popular, um, and so that might be the direction you want to go with. All right. Lisa asks, what are pros and cons of living in a traditional dorm style room versus a dual room where you or I guess a suite style where you've got separate rooms and you're sharing a, a bathroom? Yeah. Um, so it'll, it'll be slightly different depending on the person. Um, the suite style is going to be a private bedroom. Right. And so if you are not necessarily the greatest sharer, um, then I could see that being something that is a benefit to you, um, knowing that everything within your room that you can lock is yours and uh, you don't have to kind of share space with someone. Um, I will say that it tends to be less engagement amongst roommates uh, when they have private bedrooms, particularly amongst our first year students than when they do share or have that traditional um, room space when you can see your roommate within your in your actual space. Um, and so there are going to be a lot of pros and cons on both sides and it really depends on on the person I would say. I think the relationships tend to be a little bit easier to build uh, when I don't have a private room that I can seclude myself to. Um, but also on the, the flip side, uh, the con is that I also can't seclude myself away from another person if I ever do want that private time, if I'm in that traditional space, right? So maybe I'm having a phone call or uh, just really need my me time. That can be a little bit more difficult in that space. Yeah. Okay, Suzanne asks, are particular halls for freshmen and are there halls for just girls? Yes, um, so we do have first year halls. Um, we have upper class halls and then our all female hall is actually Colby. Um, Colby Hall will be that all female option. Um, you can find all of that on our website. If you go to residence halls, it'll give you a breakdown of uh, is it first year versus upper class and then Colby Hall says all female. Um, as well as a little bit more information about uh, Milton Daniel our Honors Residence Hall. Fun fact, Colby Hall is actually the name of the person, and it's uh -huh. Colby Hall Dormitory. Yeah. Right? It is, it is a very fun fact. Most people yeah. don't know that, and so we try and share that with them as they move in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they must love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Lauren asks, if you go random, when will you know who your roommate is? Like, is it at the time when you're doing your housing selection? Like, let's say I'm in my, um, I've got a later time slot. I'm one person. I see, um, uh, like, will you assign us that person in advance of our time slot or how exactly will that work? 
Yeah, no. So you'll know your roommate when you select yourself into that room. Um, so particularly in the case that you just talked about, Heath. Uh, so if I am a later time slot and I am entering a room that already has someone in it, then I, at that very moment, I would be able to see their information. So I can go to their profile, um, be able to see their answers as well as pull their email address. And so I can reach out to them starting at that point. Um, maybe I'm one of the earliest time slots, meaning um, other people haven't joined into the system yet. And so I wouldn't know because I probably selected myself into an empty room at that point in time. Um, then later on in that day, you can go back in and it'll tell you who the roommate is that's selected into the room um, if that happens. So you would know almost immediately um, of who your roommate would be and you can reach out to them. Perfect. Okay, Krista asks, can out-of-state students ship boxes to their residence halls in August so their items are available on move-in day? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I remember when I was in high school and I went to college 3,000 miles away from home and like, yeah, you got to ship stuff ahead of time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we do, don't do shipping at all, but I do know the answer to this, so I'm going to throw it out there for you. Um, once you come for orientation, they will have you uh, set up your TCU mailbox. Once you have that TCU mailbox, then you are able to start shipping things to that mailbox. Um, I will give you a pro tip though. If there are any things that you think you might need on that first night, then pack that in your bags that you take on the plane with you or in the car ride, um, because there will be thousands of people that move in on that actual move-in day. And so they are all also gonna go to the mail center. And so they're gonna be pretty long lines. So if you can skip that line and maybe pick up your boxes a day or two later, um, it could just save you a little bit of time. Great. Okay, Elizabeth Borst Cohn asks, do all rooms have air conditioning? It's an important question because it can get pretty toasty in Texas. Yes, definitely air conditioning. Um, I often ask myself, how did people live in the state of Texas before air conditioning was invented? Um, we have air conditioning everywhere, so you, you won't have to worry about that. I am from the north uh, where AC is not as prevalent, um, and so, uh, you won't have to worry about that here. Okay. Kat Lacey asks, what is the earliest time slot you can get? So when it gets, so, so we're on June 25th, you, you mentioned, you gave an example earlier of 9 a.m. versus 2 p.m. Is 9 the earliest? Is 8? Like how, how early can people possibly get? You know, that is a great question. Um, I don't want to give an answer because I don't know 100%, but I'm going to pull up my email and we'll see if we can circle back if I have it okay. in here. <laughs> I'll try to riff at some point if yes. uh, if necessary we can pull in a, like three or four more dad jokes and there we go uh, and make it make it work. Um, there was someone who was asking about frog bucks and how that works. So Imani, I'm wondering um, just generally. I mean, we're we're focusing mostly on housing and housing selection and the residence hall experience. But of course, if you're living on campus, you also have to uh, eat uh, primarily on campus. So can you talk about meal plans for our students? and then how frog bucks work. Absolutely, yeah. So um, for our first year students, there is one meal plan option, uh, which will get you swipe access so you can eat in our all you care to eat um, dining facility called Market Square, um, as well as it will come with campus cash and frog bucks. Um, and so campus cash is a dollar for dollar uh, on campus use. Uh, so you can use that at Chick-fil-A or if I just wanna grab coffee from one of our coffee shops or maybe a bag of chips or a quick snack, you can use that campus cash. Uh, Frog Bucks is going to be still a dollar for dollar. However, that is off campus. So with uh, certain businesses and restaurants that partner with TCU, uh, so you can go to McDonald's and, and use your Frog Bucks there, or we have a, a ton of eateries right across the street from campus here. Um, there is, has been a steakhouse on there too. Um, so we've had some students that didn't use it for the entire semester and just go and have a very nice fancy steak dinner at the end of the semester. Um, and so that is kind of the differences amongst them. Um, we have a number of places where you can eat all around campus. Uh, however, our largest is going to be Market Square. And so that will be where we feed the majority of our students. Um, and that would be a swipe. And I have to say, I, I know I'm paid to promote TCU. I think Market Square is fantastic. Um, I, I, love, I love the variety of foods that are, are available. Um, all of it is fresh. Um, and as Imani said, it's all you care to eat, um, that, that's, which is different from all you can eat. Um, but, um, but you're always going to have the option to, to make healthy choices, which I think is really important for, um, for people who are, in many cases, on 
living independently for the first time um, <laughs> and they don't have meals that are just right there waiting for them on the dinner table when they when they walk in. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, it got me thinking, Imani, about just programs that happen in the residence halls? Because I'm thinking about like conversations that may take place about making healthy choices and so forth. And and can you dive a little bit more into the relationships that, that RAs have with students and uh, RAs being resident assistants and how, um, and just the various programs that might occur in the residence hall system. Yeah, absolutely. So we will have a number of programs throughout the academic year in our residence halls. Um, so as mentioned, we have resident assistants. Um, so our smallest staff is five, our largest staff being 16. Um, and so they will do programs throughout, uh, particularly for our incoming first years, we will have at least one to two programs uh, a week for the first six weeks of school. Um, there's a lot of study about the first six weeks being uh, very pivotal in a student's uh, college career and just having uh, belonging to the institution and finding and forming relationships. And so we'll do a, a lot of programming there, but we will continue that throughout the entire year. Um, sometimes it will be smaller, so maybe just me and a few people uh, on my floor. Uh, sometimes it is all the entire building. Uh, and then we even do very large scale programming where we have block parties or uh, mini concerts or we'll have uh, food trucks come out um, and do things like that. We have both fun as well as educational programs, uh, things from all the way from just come out and uh, make a candle or make your own uh, doormat uh, to let's learn about uh, proper um, like hygiene or uh, wellness activities and things of that sort. So there is a wide array. Um, if I had to guess, we probably on campus do over 1500 programs a year um, within housing and residence life. So there is always something happening somewhere. And, and just Imani, tying it back to the, the earlier question we had about um, should the student live on campus? I mean, the residence hall system is um, perhaps the chief area um, in which community is, is developed on a consistent basis. I mean, we've got other, you know, first year programs that, that we do, but if you think about from the beginning to the end of the year, so much of that occurs in those halls, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very large in terms of uh, the community building. Um, so meeting those people, being able to hang out in the halls with them, uh, obviously, there are a number of different ways in which people will build community, joining student organizations, things of that sort, um, but those tend to take a little bit of time. Um, so we are one of the first opportunities for you to start those relationships. You move in and we will typically have programs on that first day of move in. So you get to start knowing people on your floor um, that live within your building, um, obviously sharing classes and majors. There's opportunity there, too. Um, however, I wouldn't encourage you talking and trying to meet friends while you're sitting in class. Uh, so <laughs> you can come back to our halls and do that with us. Um, TCU is is very fortunate to have um, what I think would be considered an enviable retention rate. Our retention rate is 91%. And what that means, um, if you're not familiar with that term, retention is the percentage of students who persist um, between their first and second year. and um, and that's a very high number if you compare us to, to other schools around the country. And I think the, the housing um, and the residence hall system is, a, is one of the key factors in that, um, that retention rate. Um, okay, Elizabeth asks, do those that rush and join a sorority live in specific housing areas? So I wonder if you could talk about um, that for both the first year perspective, what, what does it mean in terms of living if you're, um, going through the recruitment process as a first year student, and then also Greek housing at TCU. Yes. Um, so as an incoming first year student who is participating in recruitment, uh, so trying to join a sorority or fraternity, then no, you will live anywhere on campus that you select. There are not specific places in which you would live. Um, and so there are going to be women and men from all over campus that are going through a recruitment effort. Um, obviously, when you have a Kobe Hall, which is all female, there's going to be a larger ratio there than when we have uh, buildings that are co-ed. Um, however, your sophomore year, if you do join a fraternity or sorority that is housed, 
then you can live in the chapter house. Um, and so you will not be able to do that until your second year living on campus. Uh, and they will house anywhere between 25 and about 35 students. Um, so it sometimes can be a bit of a competitive process to try and get into the chapter house. Okay, uh, time for another dad joke. Um, so uh, I'm, are you ready? I'll try to be. Hopefully okay. I can give an actual answer this time. Okay, well you gave an answer last time. You didn't realize you were giving an answer, but you gave That's an answer. Fair. Okay, here's the next one. What do you call cheese without any friends? Cheese without any friends. Single. Close. Dang. Provolone. Oh. Provolone cheese. Provolone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Not bad, right? I mean, I didn't <laughs> make bad. it up, but yeah. I mean, as far as dad jokes go, that's that's pretty good. Uh, all right. This I like this question. It's timely. Um, uh, the, just this afternoon, we had a couple of parents walk into our office asking about if asking whether they could park. Uh, in our visitor lot because they're in the process of moving out their graduating senior. This question from David Meyer is about moving in. Can okay. you describe how move-in day will unfold? Yes, um, so we will talk about it in detail in more detail when you come for orientation. Um, so I won't go too much into detail here. Um, however, I will share with you what is going to happen is once you have selected your room um, and we have started to help some of those people off of the wait list, uh, then we are going to send out a time slot for move in. And so what that means is we will say, this is the day we expect for you to move in. And this is the time in which is the earliest that we would like for you to get in our process. We do that on purpose so that we can spread everyone out so that we can try and make that as seamless and quick of a process for our families as possible. Um, and so if you get a 1 p.m. time slot, then we'll just ask that you don't show up at 12 um, because it will backlog everything and people will just have to wait a little bit longer. Um, as you go through our process, it is almost all driving until you get to the process, the part where you start unloading into the room. Uh, so you will drive up uh, to us. Um, we'll kind of queue you in, take you through a couple parking lots right next to the football stadium give you your student ID if you're an incoming first year student, and then queue you into lots so that you can go to your residence hall and start unloading. We'll give you about 15 minutes to unload that car, ask for one person to take the car and park it, to free up that space so we can call the next car in, and then you have an unlimited time in order to actually get the room set up and things of that sort. Um, we really just have that 15 minutes so that we can get families into our, our residence halls. Yeah. Um, I think that there is probably little um, that is more stressful for families than than the move-in process. Yeah. And what I and you hear this over and over again, where there's 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 that anxiety leading up to it, and then what happens is they say, okay, it wasn't it wasn't that bad, mm -hmm. and or, or hey, it, it was tough, but the end result was our kids are in the place where they should be, and they're really happy, and and, and so forth. And one of the things that um, we try to continually tell our incoming students and parents. And in fact, we did this um, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we did a parent to parent program. Um, I co-hosted with uh, Dr. Emily Ivey, who is director of new student and family programs. And um, one of the themes that we return to is, is patience. Um, mm -hmm that this will all work out. And even in those moments where your, your, your heart beats a little bit faster and you start sweating and things seem like they're, they, they're not gonna go right, they will eventually work, work out. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is one of those times where we say, don't stress out too much, um, even, even though we know that it, it can be anxiety inducing. Um, okay, Brian asks, can freshmen bring their cars to campus? Um, Imani, can you talk about that? It, um, I guess I'll ask a second question on Brian's behalf, and that is, should they bring their cars to mm -hmm. campus? So one is about, just about the rules, and then, and then what do you think, uh, what's sort of the best practice? Yeah, so they certainly are able to bring their cars. Um, there is not a restriction on first-year students bringing cars to campus. Um, that is housed through our TCU uh, police department, um, parking permits, and things of that sort. Uh, it is really the determination of you um, to determine if they need to bring a, a car to campus. 
Um, the college experience uh, tends to be in a bubble, meaning that you don't really have to leave campus very often. Um, for those students who do want to get out to grocery stores or eateries, then we have those within walking distance, literally right a block off campus. Um, so many of those things are accessible. Uh, perhaps they want to go downtown. That is about five miles away from campus. So they would want to drive there. Um, I always suggest it's better to have a friend that has a car than for you to have a car because then you don't have to pay for all of the extra that comes with the car. Um, however, it is certainly within their rights to have it and um, you all as a family can determine uh, if they need to have one or not. Right, okay, good. Uh, Basim asks, do the students have to redo the housing process before the second year? So can you talk a little bit about the second year housing uh, selection process? Yes, so our uh, second year process is a different process. Um, so that actually takes place in the spring semester, uh, typically around the, the month of March. Um, and so there they will go into the housing portal, fill out their application um, and select their room, similarly to the way that they did for their first year experience. Um, however, by that time they have experienced it before, so um, they really know what they're doing and what they're looking for. Um, we see that there are typically more roommate groups for that sophomore year because I've already lived on campus um, for almost an entire academic year at that point in time. Um, so there are, there's a less amount of people who are kind of selecting without having roommate groups. But it will be the same process just at a different time of the year, um, specifically for our rising sophomores. Okay, great. All right, Joni asks, what happens if you have three roommates hoping for a quad suite, but there are none left by the time selection happens? Mm -hmm. Do those, is, it, is it the same as before where they sort of go on a wait list? Will they be initially put somewhere else? How does that all work? Yeah, so there's a couple options. One, they can just put themselves in whatever they can find so they can split each other up. Um, so you can do a two and a two, or maybe if everybody finds one space and just throws themselves into a room, you can do that. You can also just put yourself on the wait list. Um, so if you don't select into rooms, or if you do, you can still put yourself on the wait list saying the four of us would like to be together. Um, we do not put 100% of our inventory in the selection process. And so uh, that is really important for you all to know, um, because we will start get to get to a point in which groups of four uh, can't find anything for themselves. We still have some of those spaces available. Legally, we have to hold some out, um, but also it makes it a lot easier for us to help people if we know we still have inventory. If we gave it all out, then we wouldn't be able to actually help people get with their roommates or into different spaces and things of that sort. Okay, great. Um, we've had a couple of questions come through about the time slot itself. So the first mm -hmm. one from Markel is, what happens during your time slot? Is it strictly room select the room selection? And how, how long do you have to select the room? How, like, what does that window of time look like? Because I could imagine that could be um, a little anxiety inducing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so once you get your time slot, you can go in at any point in time after that. Um, and so uh, the amount of time once you put a room into your cart kind of changes. Um, so we take feedback. So I'm not sure what we're going to set it for this year um, in terms of how long once I've actually selected the room before I confirm it. Um, so I don't want to give a number uh, that might be a little bit different. However, if you do have a time slot and you're not able to get on at that exact moment, it is perfectly fine. You can go on um, at your earliest convenience and still be able to access it. You just can't access before the time slot we give you. Okay, and then um, along those same lines, Suzanne asks, how many students are in a time slot? Is your time slot dedicated to you and those in your group, or are there lots of groups in one time slot? And I don't know if you know the exact number, but you know, ballpark, is it 10 students in a time slot? Are we talking about hundreds? Do you have any, any sense of that? Yeah, um, so I actually don't know how many. It will be a number of groups in at the exact same time. So it, it depends based on what is our class size, um, how many time slots were given out, right? So in a world in which uh, there are a number of four people um, groups, then obviously we would give out less different time slots. And so um, there might be more people in there, but less groups within that certain time slot. Um, so I don't actually have a number. Uh, it will not just be you. There will be other people that are in at the exact same time selecting rooms. So we usually encourage that if you're in a roommate group, to have all members of that group get on at the exact same time and just kind of divide and conquer. 
Um, because if I am trying to select myself into one room, but someone else on the other side of the country is a little bit quicker with their uh, clicks and that room disappears, instead of me having to start over, then my roommate can say, oh, I see that this space is open. Like, let's just go over there. Um, so we will encourage that. Okay. Um, we've had a number of questions come in about the suites. Mm -hmm. And just to gi give people a sense of like, how likely they might be to get a suite. Do you know the percentage or the number uh, that would be available to entering first year students? Um, or, like what, yeah, what is the chance that someone's actually gonna get a suite? Yeah, um, the chances are a lot higher now than they have been um, a few years ago. Um, so we have seven residential communities that were built for first year students. Um, and then we have, let's see, uh, three buildings that were built for upperclassmen that currently house first year students. Um, so when we're thinking about the total of having technically 10 options that I can choose from, three of those options would be suite style for incoming first year students. Um, obviously they house different, some different amounts of people. So it's not necessarily a 30% because one hall is larger than the other. Um, but that'll give you a rough idea. Um, you'll have a lot more opportunity to select into a traditional first year experience than you would at Sweet Style. Okay, uh, that's good to know. There was a question earlier um, and, and, and you talking about how we do have some first year students in upper class housing reminded me about um, the students, will all first year students actually live with other first year students? In other words, I might be in, a, in an upper class residence hall, but will my roommate still be a first year student or might I live with somebody who's in a different uh, classification? Yeah, uh, most people will live with uh, first year. We will always create it in which you are living with another first year student. Um, every once in a while there is a, a situation in which maybe a sibling is already at TCU and you decide that you wanna be together. Um, and so we might allow that, but what is gonna be most typical uh, and the rule of thumb is that as a first year student, then your roommates would also be first year students. Right, okay, good. Um, we've had a couple of question com questions come in recently about um, what happens if when you get to that housing uh, selection that you have a slot and it's a different time from when your intended roommate does. And I know we talked about this very early on, but we may have had some people come join mm -hmm. us a little bit later. So maybe we can go over that again. If you're planning to live with somebody, how does how does that work that you get the same room? Yeah, so if you uh, are not able to get the same time slot, meaning we weren't in a group together before the application closed, uh, then you will just enter yourself into the wait list. Um, so you can select yourselves into rooms at that point in time um, and then tell us that you'd like to live together and then our assignments team will work to get you all back together. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, w David asks, how far in advance before the 25th will you know the time slot? So we know that the questionnaire closes on June 10th. We know that the selection opens on the 25th, when are people actually going to be assigned when that when their particular time slot is? Yes, so our plan is to send out time slots June 17th or earlier. Um, and so you would know roughly about a week ahead what time you are going to be selecting for your room selection. Okay, uh, that's very good. Um, Bridget asks, once you, because you mentioned earlier about um, the mailboxes that you'll be assigned, mm -hmm. once you have your mailbox assigned, is that going to be the same for your entire TCU career, or is that going to change from, from year to year? Yeah, so it'll, it would be the same until you close it. Um, actually, all mail is run through our post office, so I won't know a bunch of specifics, so I would encourage you to reach out to them, but you'll have that same number until you close that mailbox. Okay, good. Uh, Kelly asks, does one have to pay extra for a suite style if it's given as a special accommodation? If there's a reason, um, for whatever reason, medically or, or, or what have you, a student must live in a suite, are they still going to be charged uh, a different rate? 
Yeah, so we charge based on occupancy. Um, so actually on our website, you can find exactly the buildings and how much it would, we would charge based on the occupancy rates. Um, if you do have special accommodations, then what is most typical is you would still be charged for the rate of whatever um, space you are in. Um, there are some instances in which that is a little different. And so this sounds like a, a special case. So feel free to reach out to us if you do have a question, um, housing at tcu.edu. Okay. Um, let's see. What if you are at orientation on June 25th? How will room selection work? That's a good question. I guess I didn't think about uh, there being an orientation on the 25th. Yeah, um, fortunately we have Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, so uh, you'll be able to uh, still hop on. Um, I would probably speak with your orientation leader um, to let them know. Um, I'm sure they'll, they'll work with you and give you time to kind of step away to try and get yourself situated in the room. Um, if that is not something you're interested in, what you can do is if you are in a roommate group, uh, you can assign the group leader to maybe someone who doesn't have orientation on June 25th because group leaders can assign everyone in their group to a room. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be you or you can find a proxy, uh, maybe a best friend or a parent or uh, a guardian. Um, they can also log in and, and select the room for you as another option too. Um, Imani, uh, Janet asks, what is the policy if a student tests positive for COVID and is living in a resident hall with other students. Yeah, so I can only speak to what is currently happening because as you all know, uh, with COVID things change all the time. Um, so currently there is an isolation process. If I am in one of those shared spaces in which I can't isolate from my uh, roommate, then we will put you in what is current a hotel. Um, if I'm in a private space, then you can stay in that private space. If you have access to a, a bathroom in which your roommates do not have to access, um, and so that is currently what the process is. I would, I'm not able to speak about what it will be uh, once you all arrive in August or in a year or so. Okay, Imani, we're, we're just about out of time and I wanted to just, I'm gonna ask you one final question um, and you've been so, um, so, um, <clears throat> so giving of your time this evening and we're, we're grateful. Um, what's the one piece of advice that you would give to, um, I'm going to ask you two two questions in one. What is the one piece of advice you would give to students who are coming to TCU this fall and um, for the first time as they're thinking about moving in um, and what that experience might be like? And then to families who might be just starting their college search process, what is something they ought to be thinking about as they're looking at different colleges when it comes to to housing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think to the student that is coming and thinking about what does the move-in process look like, um, I would say take it all in, um, but also don't focus too much on is it the way that I thought it was going to be. Um, so we particularly see that students uh, might come on a tour and see this one residence hall and feel as though I have to live in that hall or my experience is going to be completely different than what I envisioned. Um, I would say we don't get ranked as a fourth best halls um, because we only have one that's really great, um, but we have many that will be a great experience for you. So uh, don't lock too much in on I need to be in this particular place. Um, and so if you're not able to get into that space on the first uh, go around in terms of selection, uh, there's a wait list as well. And maybe if you don't, then it might just be fate for you to live in that one residence hall that you didn't ex necessarily expect. Um, the move-in process uh, can be an emotional one, um, even if you are excited about what is to come. Um, so just know that uh, we will have a ton of staff members around to really help you and the people that you brought with you through that experience, um, get you here situated. And again, we care about you. And so uh, that process of relationship building starts from the minute that you hit our doors. Um, and so we will be there for you and be able to talk you through some things if you need to. Um, for our, our students that are, are a little bit earlier in the process, um, as you are looking at your institutions and thinking about housing, I think it's important for you to, to really think through what is the experience that I want to get out of when I live in housing. Um, we are a, a high touch relationship driven housing department. And so there are going to be some students that are really looking for that. They want to make sure that their staff members know who they are, that they reach out to them, that they talk with them and build those relationships. Um, and then there are going to be some students who are like, I actually just want a place to lay my, my head. 
Um, I don't really need to speak to people and maybe doesn't have as much of a focus on the relationships um, or as much of a focus on uh, being high touch and just kind of being there to be able to give you what this great experience is. So really thinking through what are your non-negotiables as you think through living somewhere. Um, and that can be really helpful. Um, the, the spaces, uh, I went to school in New York, so did my sister. Um, she went to school in New York City, so she laid on her bed and her roommate did too. They could touch each other's feet. Um, so sometimes it's important to know I need a little bit more room. Um, and so there, there's going to be a number of things that can be non-negotiables for you. So just be kind of looking out for those things. Well, Imani, um, thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate your partnership in this. Uh, I also want to extend my gratitude to um, uh, Amy Peterson from TCU Marketing mm -hmm. and Communication and Liz Rainwater from the TCU Office of Admission, who have been working behind the scenes to make sure that this Facebook Live event runs smoothly. Um, to everyone out there, thank you for participating. We appreciate you so much. If you're going to be starting at TCU this fall, we cannot wait to welcome you. Um, and, uh, and, and for everybody have a wonderful night and go frogs. Go frogs.